That's me taking the bull by the horns. It's a metaphor, but that actually happened. Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies. This is episode 225, and I'm your host, the mayor, Jeff Hornacek. Thank you guys so much for joining us for the movie discussion tonight. Before we get started, we have to go around and meet the fellow bros. We begin with our legal counsel, Ronnie Cycli. Now, Ronnie, I know that you worked at the same law firm as Kate Veach from Dodgeball. And I have to ask, there were rumors that when she was actually fired from the Globo Gym account for allegedly drinking on the job, that you replaced her. So is that true? And if so, what was Global Gym and White Goodman like as a client? I, I wish I could answer that because, yes, I was hired immediately, but also was fired within an hour for also drinking on the job. So I, I, I really, one, can't. I don't really remember because I was also drunk, but two, wasn't there long so drunk, to establish yeah. rapport. Also, oh, yeah. what lawyer we, isn't drinking on the that's job? What I'm that's saying. like what we do. <laughs> There's a scene in um, the movie The Watch with also with Vince Vaughn where they're like doing a stakeout and the cops come up because he's like chugging beers in his car while it's parked. And the cops are like, dude, you can't do that. And when the cops walk away, he's like, Jesus, can't even drink in your car now? <laughs> it's like, what is when this? were you God. able to do that? Communist <laughs> America. <laughs> He's like actually appalled that that's like the law. <laughs> he says now. I was like, I don't know if that was. This is true. You can look up videos in the 80s where they first made these rules. And there's like like legitimate videos of people going like, what kind of country is this? I can't drink a beer now after work driving in my car going home. Like, it's real. This this is how people felt. <laughs> Although I don't know what the you would probably know better than me because you've been to Europe a lot more than I have. But Europeans would like laugh at the fact that like. We can't drink like a Miller Light and then drive home. They're like, that's basically water. What do you mean? You drink this piss water, the swill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. But we'll, at least in our defense, when we do, we drink about 30 of them. So we don't really notice. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have the mad scientist, Brian Banner. Now, Banner, as a scientist, is there any chance you can divulge what the ingredients to the cologne Sex Panther are and how many of them are actually legal in North America? Uh, well, as far as, as far as, uh, the ingredients, I, I can't divulge that. It's actually a very secret recipe, um, highly confidential pet, patent pending. Um, and as far as where it may or may not be legal, I have been advised, uh, by our legal counsel to, as he put it, shut the fuck up and stop talking about it. Um, so, uh, I, I, it's not legal here. Sorry. Yeah, he well, sixty percent is illegal everywhere. Exactly. When they when they say it as real bits of panther, I always wondered like which part of the panther <laughs> did they grind up? Oh, you like, know what parts of the panther? The, oh, I hope not. <laughs> is this the toe? Oh, it's not. Okay. It's oh. it's. I wish it was. <laughs> I, I think the it's the genitalia. One, in the second Anchorman, when he in, instead of the cologne scene, he's giving uh, out like a series of condoms. And he has one, and he goes, this one's made from sheepskin, so it doesn't work. <laughs> Interesting choice of material. All right, we begin every episode of the Bro4 Squad podcast with the most important thing in any bro's life, and that is chest day. And today's chest day, uh, if you looked at the title of this episode, you got a little preview of it. We are doing another one of our bro versus bro matchups, where two bros Come each you, are bro. saddled. Come at me, bro. Does this America. Where two bros are each given a movie, and they are arguing against uh, the other bro as to which movie is superior, using the five bro four squad criteria, with a third bro judging. Now, tonight, Brian Banner, since you will be uh, essentially your honor and the judge for this bro v. bro, why don't you tell the people how it works, what the five categories are, and then which of the two movies will be up against each other, represented by our legal counsel, Ronnie Cycli, and myself. Uh, yeah, so uh, as we do everything here on the Bro4 Squad, we go by our five Bro4 Squad criterion. So to win this Bro v. Bro, uh, the winning Bro needs to win at least three out of the five categories, being acting cast, story plot, best scene, uh, impacts on pop culture, uh, and rewatchability. Rewatch yes. Um, you have to win... At least three of those five. 
Uh, but because it's Vegas, we always play it out. Uh, so ultimately, it could be a 3-2 win. Uh, the movies tonight that are going up against each other is R R Dodgeball being defended or, yeah, I guess defended by the mayor himself. And coming out of the red corner, we have our legal counsel defending Anchorman, the legend of Ron Burgundy. Let me ask you guys this before we get started. <clears throat> so the technical, both these movies have subtitles in the uh, title of it. The technical title of Dodgeball is Dodgeball, a true underdog story. I have never referred to it as that, but I sometimes have called Anchorman, the legend of Ron Burgundy. What about you guys? I, I've only ever said Anchorman and Dodgeball, to be honest with you. I, I know it's also called the legend of Ron Burgundy, but I'm not, I just don't have enough time in the day for that. You're super busy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Think it's about how much time to say those extra words. I, I've never called it that. Over the course of your life, you've probably saved minutes by not saying the full title. God, over time, yeah. Good for you, man. Maybe even like four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I got Dodgeball, and uh, Ronnie has the OG Anchorman. And we are doing these because they both came out in 2004, and actually... As we're recording this, uh, yesterday was the 20-year anniversary of Dodgeball to the date releasing in theaters. June 18th, 2004 is when that movie came out. And and we're about three weeks from the 20-year of Anchorman. Nice. What a fucking summer, dude. That That's fucking wild. I remember that summer. It was, it was crazy. Crazy, crazy. All right, let's get us started. Uh, let's get it. That, it's also been like 20 years since that song. Wow. God. Not I'm accident. not joking. <laughs> that 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 was not on purpose, guy. Like we did not plan that. We're just naturally that good. <laughs> All right. We are going to get started here with uh acting and cast. Uh Ronnie, let's go to you first. Uh acting and cast. Why should I give the point to Anchorman? Oh, the Legend of Robert. You See, can I just do got whatever you want, saying. Brian. Like whatever you want. I'm not going to dictate your life like you're free to make a choice but i'm going to tell you about the legend of ron burgundy and what it came with and, and a lot of times we see movies that are quantity right we see movies that are quality of actors this is both right like because they don't just have a number of incredible comedic performances in this they play it with subtlety right it's not like bombarded with almost too much of a character. We get an incredible cast that is perfectly played uh, with a perfect amount of screen time by every character. So when we talk about the main cast, we talk about Will Ferrell, Will Ferrell Steve Carell, Paul Rudd, Christina Applegate, David Koechner, like, right, incredible core who on its own would just be able to sell any comedy on their own. Um, and then you wait, you on the supporting cast, we have Chris Parnell and Fred Armisen, uh, sorry, and uh, and Fred Willard as well. And then you have the really the cameo cast that comes in with Ben Stiller and then Tim Robbins, Luke Wilson, Fred Armisen, which I said, Trinity Trejo, Vince Vaughn, uh, Jack Black, Luke Wilson. Like the list just keeps going in terms of that's an incredible amount of star power and uh, obviously a lot of carryover that we're also that we're going to talk about in Dodgeball. But have how much is perfectly played? I mean, Jack Black scene. Jack Black is in it for about one and a half minutes, and that scene stands out incredibly. Just like Ben Stiller, just like Vince Vaughn in his limited screen time, each one plays their part so perfectly that they stand out. Like it's it's not like you forget that Vince Vaughn is in this film, even though he's in it for a few minutes. It's not like you forget Ben Stiller is in it, even though he's only in it for a scene or two. Or Fred Armisen and Fred Willer or Chris Parnell. It's just absolutely incredible what this film does when so many other movies attempt to do what this does and fail because it almost goes too much. They try too hard. And I don't know of a comedy like this that really plays it with such subtlety that really has a star power like this. Um, and, and really the cast list can keep going. It's, it's really incredible what this does. Speaking real quick to Ben Stiller's cameo, uh, look based on his costuming, 
I wonder if he literally just like came over from the set of Dodgeball. <laughs> oh, I get. Here's the thing. This is what's so fun about this is like the overlap between these two films, and you know they were absolutely being filmed right next to each other at oh, the same 100%. time. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And like, and that's why the subtlety is 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 fantastic. It's just like they just were able to play off of it. And again, every it's just a perfect touch. And and so many times we've seen these actors overplayed in 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 so many of these comedies. And and for them to pull it off the way they did, I, you know, there's a reason why people don't talk about Anchorman two the way they talk about Anchorman. And, and this is this is unbelievable. And this is probably a top five film in terms of cameos ever. Ben Stiller's character's response when the rule is announced: no touching of the head, <laughs> hair, or face area. He's like, of course, of course, we're not, we're not animals. <laughs> it's like you don't even have to mention it, duh. <laughs> All right, Horns, why should I give this point to Dodgeball? And if I sound weird, I'm having mic problems, so my apologies. Okay, that's all right, because as, as your honor, luckily you'll, you know, your main <laughs> job here is to evaluate. But uh, there, like Cycli said, there actually is quite a bit of overlap here, although, you know, it's, it's in the majority of these are cameos. However, Wes Mantooth, played by Vince Vaughn in Anchorman, I think his character is a little more pivotal than his actual screen time. But... I think what Dodgeball does so well in terms of cast is uh, it hits like if you're talking about performances, uh, it, it's a lot of these actors like hitting their peak. For example, Ben Stiller's White Goodman, obviously, I think based off of his character from Heavyweights. But uh, first off, anytime he has the handlebar mustache, whether it's this or Happy Gilmore or even an anger man, you know that you are in for an, and for, for an epic Ben Stiller comedic performance. And he, I mean, I, I rewatched this movie today and the amount of quotes that he had, even ones that I like missed when I first watched it, they're just incredible. Vince Vaughn, <clears throat> let me give you in a span of 16 months, these are Vince Vaughn's three comedic performances that he had. Uh, old School, dodgeball and then wedding crashers in 2004 so i don't think we're ever gonna find maybe jim carrey in the late 90s and mid 90s if things worked out but a 16 month stretch where someone was in three incredible for me iconic comedies in that short a period of time um and old school was my because i i hadn't seen swingers yet at the time that was my first introduction to vince vaughn as a comedic actor and i still maintain although the movie isn't the funniest movie i've ever seen his individual performance in the breakup, I think, is pound for pound the single best comedic performance I've ever seen. Like his, I, I think it's people sleep on his fucking quotes in that movie are absolutely insane. Uh, let me ask you guys this question: Which of these names sounds more made up, Rip Torn or Patches O'Houlihan? Because Rip Torn, the legendary Rip Torn, plays Patches O'Houlihan. We get it. <laughs> We get a young Justin Long. We get the great Steven Root, uh, obviously coming off of Office Space, but we end up seeing his range eventually in the movie Get Out. Alan Tudyk uh, has, again, if you pitch the idea of Steve the Pirate in a board meeting, like how the fuck does that get into the film? Somehow it works. But I think the seed stealing performance in this, and whether you realize it or not, you have quoted probably today, one of these two characters. It's Gary Cole, who of course is Will Ferrell's dad in Talladega Nights, as Cotton McKnight, and Jason Bateman as Pepper Brooks, who parodies essentially like the sportscasters who always say the most fucking obvious thing of all time, with maybe one of the greatest quotes ever in a sports movie, when uh, Cotton McKnight says, it appears average Joe's is going to forfeit. And Pepper Brooks says, bold strategy, Cotton, let's see if it pays <laughs> off for <her." laughs> So if we're talking like heavy hitters, and again, at the time, I think all their star power was relatively equitable. Anchorman probably has the edge, but I think White Goodman's performance alone, to me at least, stands out more than any performance in these two movies. So that's why I would say Dodgeball should get the point here. This is a tough one, because I think both of these uh, casts are stacked, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I think the difference is is the movie that's going to get this point is these actors I felt did a little more acting as opposed to we're just in this movie with everybody else. While I still think it all worked, um, I think some of them actually worked, if you will, instead of just kind of showing up. Um, and I'm going to give this point to Dodgeball. I think that there was a little bit more 
more involved in the characters and they had to I don't want to say dig deep because I mean these are how dare you Christina Applegate the, deserved the, better than that I disagree <laughs> all right we're the better Chris yeah we had a two great Christine performances <clears throat> all right uh, story plot uh we're gonna go uh snake style horns story plot all right I personally think I have a bit of an advantage here because the plot of Anchorman is literally just uh, Veronica Corningstone shows up and a panda is going to be born. <laughs> it's really just how do we get from set piece to set piece and let these actors show their their stuff? And it works as a film. But if we're talking actual story, Dodgeball does have the advantage. Now, it is a sports movie, and I think what makes this movie so great is it is a sport that I would venture to say almost everyone who has seen this movie – has actually played this sport. So you have some cursory knowledge of it, even if it was like a few times in elementary school, and it's super relatable. Um, it was like the game du jour in PE growing up. Um, so it's a it's your classic sports trope. Group of misfits is trying to put together a team to win a competition, in this case, the Las Vegas uh, Open, uh, to save their little gym. And, of course, Dwight Goodman is the over-the-top antagonist who we kind of love to hate, but we want to see him on screen as much as possible. Uh, Peter LaFleur has his ragtag group of players with his one ringer in Kate Veach. I mean, it, it hits a lot of the tropes, but at the same time, it acknowledges them. And how many times can you, even though it's like such low-hanging fruit and the lowest common denominator, the scene where it's just the montage of poor Justin Long repeatedly getting hit in the face from... <laughs> different positions with dodgeballs like every time it cuts back to him he's like contorted a different way and just gets hit in the face and uh apparently when they were filming this ben stiller um like kept fucking with him telling him that like oh the camera wasn't on for that and shit like that so his reaction is like a lot of self-defeat like how long do i have to be here and get hit in the face uh so plot wise i just think dodgeball it's I know it hits a few more tropes. Anchorman is definitely more unique because it's sort of a plotless movie in, in a weird way. It makes it's almost like Step Brothers in that way where like it kind of works so well when it shouldn't. But if you're talking like an actual story, I think Dodgeball has the advantage here, even though it is a little bit more cliche because it is a, a like sports underdog movie. Legal counsel, Mr. Cycli. I find that incredibly offensive that you think this is such a simple plot for Anchorman. Ooh, and incredibly sexist, especially to, to Mr. Banner here, who has a daughter, that the the plot of Anchorman is about a woman breaking a glass ceiling and breaking into journalism and being welcomed into the homes of America on a and being a becoming the one of the first female anchors. And this is really while a comedy, it's a still semi-true story in terms of American journalism. As Barbara Walters was the first female uh, anchor woman nationally syndicated in 1976, that wasn't that long ago that Anchorman was kind of portraying uh, that that someone like Christina Applegate's character was um, symbolically playing and profiling. So, you know, to, to just really just break down Anchorman into a simplistic story is just, it's just kind of offensive. And, you know, I just, I just really take that personally. And while, you know, the, the story Person, of, personally. of Ron Burgundy is, I, you know, a the, female journalist, <laughs> take it. And I'm just saying, I just want a lot of women listening and any daughters out there to know that they don't have to be held back by certain, uh, um, the way things are and that they can break barriers and that, you know, Ron was someone who was considered the best in his pro in, in his industry. And he still was stagnant. And that's the cool thing about the story is he was the best. And yet that didn't mean someone else couldn't come in and be better than him and challenge him. And, and so the story really isn't just about what he was able to bring to the table. It was that someone was able to bring to him and make him better and how they together as a group, what they offer to America is as a, as a news duo. So um, it was, it's a very fun story to obviously make and, and bring down in a simplistic sense of making a comedic story about the downfall and the rise of Ron Burgundy, but it, it's hard. It's about a story about a woman pursuing her dreams and, and breaking that glass ceiling. Is that all? Yeah, that's it. Just that? Just that. Wow, that was, uh, this was very compelling. Um, 
It's a little this desperate. is this is this is this is a tough one because you made a good sell. You made a good sell there, uh, uh, Cycli. Um, I, I I have to go with with dodgeball again. I think that. <laughs> Uh, Anchorman is kind of plotless while it was a valiant effort and you actually made me think about it uh, for, you know, three I'm going to just tell Baby seconds. Banner about that. that uh, she lawyer. doesn't have the ability to to ever break a glass ceiling then. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's already above the ceiling, so like we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Snake Style. So, Ronnie, you're back up. Best scene. Uh, you're in the hole. Man, O2. yeah, I don't know, too. Can I get it back? Man, this is tough. Man, th- here's another thing about this is a difficult one for me, too, because Anchorman is one of those movies that, damn, it's like, it's just like every scene is such like, a you banger. Gotta, you got to choose, choose carefully. Right weapon, you know? you got to choose carefully, right? Like, so you have the jazz, the jazz flute, right? Afternoon Delight, the punting Baxter. I mean, like fuck but honestly like the whole it, first if it's, party they throw the, the yeah like i have a <laughs> can't, i have a breaking announce i have breaking news announcement cannonball but if it's not i mean maybe i'm wrong on this but for me it has to be and it kind of alludes to back on the when i went back to the cast and how perfectly played this movie was with the amount of people and the star power and the comedic power in this film and how gently they were able to play the 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 amount of people in this into one scene which is uh the news team fight and and how i mean not just the amount of people in the fight the comedy that takes place um in that in that scene is incredible i mean brick kills a guy i mean things escalate really quickly (laughs) Right. <laughs> like, like, I mean, the, the one liners that come out of it, the, the dialogue, the negotiating, the negotiation that takes place. Tim Robbins coming out of left field, like Oscar winner coming out of nowhere to, to participate in this PB. Like, I love that PBS got involved. Like, they're like, yeah, we're public news. We're going to get in here. Like that, that scene, I think, has 100 percent stayed in terms of like 20 years later in the top comedic moments in movie history that is just reference to this day it's memed it's gift nonstop, all the time in group chats and uh i think it's like if you had to take one thing from this movie it's the news team fight horns what's going up against the news team fight <clears throat> all right i have the one that i actually want to go with and then i have one that i just think aged incredibly hilariously but that one's not going to be my actual argument i just want to bring it up so Cycli has, I, I'm glad you went with the news team fight because that's what I would have gone with too if I had Anchorman. And I, it obviously is iconic. And I think it actually ends up looking even better after they try to top it in Anchorman 2. And it's just like, dude, stop. <laughs> uh, I didn't even, I couldn't make it to Anchorman 2, I'll be honest. <laughs> Anchorman okay, well, it's 2 very, is in the bottom five of my movies that I've ever watched. I, I couldn't that, make it through about 15 minutes. I, so, I stopped it. Jim Carrey shows up as a cameo for someone. There's a there's even more cameos. He's like a Canadian news network. Will Smith shows up as part of ESPN, but they, they basically just try and made it like bigger and got more star power. And Harrison Ford shows. I mean, he's in the movie, but he shows up too. Anyway, in Dodgeball, the scene that I wanted to go with is uh, a scene that I also think is iconic, and it's right after Average Joe's qualifies for the Vegas Open via disqualification against Girl Scout Troop Four One Eight because the one girl tested positive for three types of anabolic steroids and a low-grade beaver tranquilizer. They go they go out to a restaurant to celebrate, and White Goodman shows up with the Globo Gym Purple Cobras and ruins their celebration and introduces them to his team. And there's two reasons this is iconic. Number one, who at some point hasn't said Blade, Blazer, Blazer, <laughs> when they're introducing friends? The other one is the meme that has come, maybe one of the most used uh, memes, and that is White Goodman saying touche to yep. Peter LaFleur after Peter LaFleur just says, like, I agree with you, Dwight. And he goes, White, and he goes, all right, touche. <laughs> There's also another great quote there where White Goodman says, you think we're afraid of some team whose best player is a pirate? And he thinks he's a pirate, and the only issue Peter LaFleur has with it is, look, we've only had one game. 
we don't even know who our best player is yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the argument that he makes back to him. Um, I just love that scene. I love meeting the Globo Gym Purple Cobras. Uh, Katinka Inga Bogova Manana, whose home country of Romanovia won the, power, the dodgeball championship five years running. Uh, it's just a great scene to meet the, the, all the characters in the movie. And then, of course, the touche gif. I think we've all used probably in like the last few weeks at some point. Touche. Touche. Yes. <laughs> nice. Um, oh, sorry. Real quick. The honorable mention scene. How hilarious is it that the speech given to Peter Lafleur to get him to actually show up for the championship and not forfeit is given by Lance Armstrong? <laughs> like now, in hindsight, you're which like, is oh. even funny. Yeah, it's even That's funnier a, now. So some people would say it doesn't age well. I almost think it's more comedic now going back. <laughs> that and that and Especially the because the, you knew, like, you knew what he, you knew he, or you know he knew what he was doing at the time. Oh, thousand percent. And the quote that he has right before he leaves, Peter's like, "Well, I'm sure you have your reasons for not showing up, and it won't haunt you for the rest of your life." He's like, oh. <laughs> but again, if no one quit when the going got tough, how would how would they have something to regret for the rest of their life? Like, well, all right. But yeah, I thought that what going back, I thought that scene was hilarious, knowing what we know now about Lance Armstrong. But that's not my best thing. <laughs> The restaurant. Um, Horns, well, that is a very great scene. And again, uh, produced one of the most used memes, at least around our uh, group of friends. Uh, I have to go with the news fight scene. There's Still just too alive, much power. Baby. Just too much power there. Um, as Ronnie so eloquently put, you have all of these characters meshing beautifully together. Everybody's staying in their lane, um, and it it is a sorry you froze after you That's said it. it is a great scene. <laughs> that was it. That was all you would suspend. Yeah. it's a what? Yeah. <laughs> and again, uh, I think it, so... I think it helps the news anchor fight scene that we've seen it done in the sequel poorly and not effectively because sure. you actually kind of appreciate how hard it is to put that together. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. All right, uh, we're going snake style again. I don't remember who's up, though, but whoever's up, uh, Impacts on Pop Jeff Culture. Up. All right, Horns. All right, well, Dodgeball, I think, uh, has a special place in a lot of people's hearts because it's a unique type of sports movie where it's like sort of lampoons the actual sport that it's about. Is it even about a sport? Uh, but if we're talking impact, let's just talk about things that we've taken away from the movie. Now, who has not made some joke referencing ESPN 8, the Ocho, at some point? Which I really wish was an actual channel. Uh, because, like, the montage before the Vegas Invitational, like, some of the <laughs> sports that they, like, show in highlights are ridiculous. There's one where it's just that video. Actually, it's from Anchorman of the squirrel riding the jet ski. Yep. That they show. <laughs> Like, that would be on ESPN 8, the Ocho. What? Which is kind of crazy. Um, just, again, the characters that we meet, Ben Stiller in his iconic role, we get classic quotes like, uh, <laughs> bold strategy cotton, let's see how it pays off. I think we've all just said bold strategy cotton at some point, yeah. too. Um, Literally said it today. Yeah. In college, Banner, I'm sure you remember this, uh, pretty much every intramural sport that we played there was a team called the Pur the Globo Gym Purple Cobras. Yep. Like people just or average Joes. People would just uh, name themselves that. One yeah. other quote doesn't really tie into impact, but I rewatching the movie today, I missed this the first time. And I think this is one of the funniest quotes of the whole movie. Before average Joes goes and competes in the uh, qualifying dodgeball game, they're coming up with ideas on how to raise money to save average Joes. And Daryl on their team says we could sell blood and semen and the really skinny guy goes, Oh, and he goes, well, not mixed together. <laughs> just like what? Utterly ridiculous line. Uh, I just think dodgeball is very accessible as a sports movie, even though I love it early uh, to mid two thousands. Will Ferrell was very polarizing for a lot of people. Like some people watch Steve Carell's performance in that and they can't even get through it. But I think dodgeball is a little more accessible for people, and as a result, for the impact, I think it's just a has more wide appeal as a comedy movie. Lawyer, go. Yeah, see, I I do fundamentally disagree there. Whether or not like 
um, feel a certain way about either of these movies. I do think if you go down the street and ask the average American, I think Anchorman long term is, is going to be your best bang for your buck uh, over and over out of um, you're going to ask. Anchorman is going to stand the test of time. Anchorman is going to be the most quotable. Anchorman is going to be the best known. I mean, again, we, we we talk about we can do quotes all day. I mean, you're right. These are both incre- incredibly quoted movies, right? I mean, how many times are we pre-pod, you know, going like, how now, Brown Count? How now, Brown Count? The and our cars was denied a bank loan. Like we just <laughs> do we just sit there and do all of the milk was a bad choice. How many times a day do I sit there and look at my dog and go, you ate a whole wheel of cheese? I'm not even mad. Cooked in the refrigerator. I'm not even mad. I'm impressed. <laughs> like it, it's an incredibly quotable movie. I mean, Sixty percent of the time, it works every time. I mean, I could literally we could we could do this all day. I mean, because ha- okay, half the things you see on Twitter are jokes about men's entire personalities being just sitting there and hanging Ooh. out with their friends and quoting Anchorman. <laughs> like that's literally a meme on the internet is men's personalities. This is what men do. We don't talk about our actual feelings. We don't talk our about how we're doing in life. We don't talk about our mental illness or mental health or anything. No, no, no. We just quote Anchorman all day long. <laughs> and I mean, whether or not like that holds up on, on whatever, the impact has been that, that 20 years later, we are still quoting Anchorman to each other, that, Anchor, that, that Will Ferrell is still referenced as Ron Burgundy, that Steve Carell as Brick Tamlin, we still reference I Love Lamp all the time and we still say whammy whenever we say anything like that so i I mean these are these are really difficult but i just think at the end of the day that that anchorman is by the general public going to be more quotable more culturally known and 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 long term going to be more shared uh yeah i have to agree with you on that one cycly uh this is going into the final one two two tied um I think that Dodgeball, while it does have some great quotes, it is not as, doesn't have as many quotable that we are going to use in your everyday life, if you will. And essentially that point was just a quote off between you two. Uh, and it was, I had to stop. I I wrote all my favorite quotes of Anchorman and I had to stop. I'm not joking. (laughs) I was like, I can't because I'm going to do the whole fucking movie. (laughs) Like, it's so So, ridiculous. I'm, I love Scotch, Scotchy, Scotch, Scotch. Scotch. There it goes down. down. Down down (laughs) I'm totally fine with Cycli winning that one, although I do feel like at this point it is like a battle of the Titans. On a rewatch of Dodgeball, though, because uh, I watched it today, I wrote down two other quotes that I had never picked up on before that I just wanted to share with you guys real quick. So <laughs> first off, uh, in the beginning, when Average Joe's is trying to raise money to stop uh, Global Gym overtaking them, remember, they throw that car wash and they accidentally do it on the same day that the high school cheerleaders are throwing their own car wash. And they're like, the only guy that's actually come by as a customer is that creepy dude that said Justin washes truck twice. But the real funny quote from that is afterwards, they go back to Average Joe's and they're just having like a beer. And Peter LaFleur says, look, guys, if an impromptu car wash isn't enough to raise $50,000 in one day, then maybe it's just not in the cards. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, another, <laughs> and, and, and another great quote that he has is when, uh, and Vayner, I feel like this is something you really appreciate. When Catherine Veach, the lawyer, first comes to Average Joe's and says, <clears throat> hey, you're uh, – in default, like you haven't made payments on this gym in like six months. Uh, she like asked him like, how did you end up like becoming the owner of this place? And he's like, yeah, I took like a semester of junior college classes and then dropped out. And she goes, really not very ambitious, are you? And this is his quote that he has that I love. He goes, quote, I've always found that if you have a goal, you might not reach it. <laughs> Just a it's great true. philosophy. No <laughs> goals and that we can never fall short of them. Genius. All right. That's all I had. It's not wrong. Guys, for the win, rewatchability. Uh, I believe Cycli, you are up first. Why yeah, I mean this is this is for all the marbles. Why Anchorman and not why Dodgeball? I'll, I'll keep it I'll keep it simple and short and and I'll keep it personal, to be honest. I mean, one, we're talking about everything we've said, right? The impact, the quotes. It, it it doesn't get old. It's perfectly played. It doesn't. It, everyone stays in their lane. It actually very much doesn't like. It actually really doesn't oversell itself, which is crazy for a Will Ferrell movie. 
like you really do. It's one of his rare performances where it's really because I think he's so complimented by the cast around him with Christine Applegate and, and everyone else. It's just like, actually just like, you don't feel like you're suffocated by that. But, um, to be honest with you outside of the quotes and everything else is I've only seen dodgeball once. So once what's more rewatchable, wow. Jeff, how many times have you seen uh, anchorman more than once? Have you seen dodgeball more than once? So the fact that you've seen both of those more than once, so that means, well, Anchorman's rewatchable. So, what? you know, because I've seen them both multiple times. Anchor. Yeah, that multiple. means it's more rewatchable. I've, I've only seen dodgeball once. So you, you are the only litmus test we need, right? Yeah. I said, I'm going to make the <laughs> argument personal. I said, I've only seen dodgeball once. I thought you would maybe make it personal to the person judging. Not yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, but no. I, I misread that. That's an interesting no, I, uh, strategy. Well, I, I tried going personal. On, or, That's a bull strategy, I, I, Colin. It, it, yeah, let's see if it pays touche. off. <laughs> touche. Touche. I tried going personal with uh, the judge earlier when I made it about Baby Banner breaking glass ceilings, but he cl- he clearly didn't care about that. So, so your you argument know. is I want to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. I'm just saying it's not that rewatchable <laughs> because I saw it and I never watched it again. Okay. Uh, right. Horns. I don't know. Beat what else am I supposed argument. to say? <laughs> No, we're, if you're asking us what you're supposed to say, I think that's d- enough of an argument in and of itself. Um, I've probably seen, if I'm being, I'll be completely transparent. I've probably seen Anchorman more than I have seen Dodgeball of these two movies, but I've seen them both probably at least five times. And going back and watching them, I think the thing that makes Dodgeball inherently more rewatchable is the disparity that you get in terms of the different comedic scenarios. So Anchorman has that great core cast of the news team, of course, like even uh, Paul Rudd's Brian Fantana, who I don't think we've really talked about too much to me is like the scene stealer of the whole (laughs) group. But it's essentially the four of them the entire time, just in different scenarios. Uh, Dodgeball has a couple different options. So first off, if you actually go back and rewatch the movie, White Goodman and Peter LaFleur really only share screen time for the most part, the first 10 minutes of the movie and like the last 15 minutes. So you get Ben Stiller, a comedic tour de force in and of himself. And then you get Peter LaFleur. And I already told you two quotes of his that I didn't even pick up on the first couple times I watched it. His group is hilarious. Then you actually get to the Dodgeball tournament where we get a little bit more of the physical humor Obviously, Jason Bateman and Gary Cole are complete scene stealers. So I think, and again, we also have great cameos. Who can forget the Chuck Norris thumbs up vote? Uh, William Shatner is the dodgeball chancellor. Um, So there's some other fun uh, people introduced there. And then, of course, Lance Armstrong. So I think dodgeball just takes you to a few different locales. It has, it's constantly, uh, it's more of a dynamic movie where it's always putting you in different situations. And then whether you're, you like gag humor, grotesque, early uh aughts humor or the actual sports humor that's derived just from the mere fact that it's a movie about dodgeball i think there's more to it comedically whereas anchorman while it's of course an iconic comedy movie it sort of replays the hits in terms of it's these same four guys uh going to different areas making ridiculous comments about being misogynist or drinking scotch and also just a cherry on top i want to win so i also wanted to use cycling's <laughs> argument Oh, wow. Fuck. I like my movie. <laughs> this is tough because you both like your movies and you both want to win. How am I supposed to decide now? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, this is tough for me because um, I've seen both of these movies probably probably three or four times. I would say equally the same amount. Um, I personally am not a Will Ferrell fan. I don't I don't think he's funny. I don't like him. I, if I have an option to watch a movie with him in it or with him out, not in it, I'm probably going to opt to the one that he's not in, uh, especially when uh, Dodgeball has a little bit more of a story. Uh, we've got kind of three separate acts and um, there's a problem at the beginning and that problem gets solved at the end. Whereas Anchorman, I, it's a lot of good laughs and that's, that's about it for me. So Dodgeball is going to take it 3 2. Uh, Horns, victory speech. Uh, I'll quote Gary Cole when Average Joe's wins the Dodgeball Championship. <laughs> Do you believe in unlikelihoods? <laughs> Which I didn't pick up on that quote the first time I saw it. <laughs> you <laughs> believe pretty... in unlikelihoods. Also, there's a quote when the Dodgeball tournament starts and he's like, 
teeing it up for the coverage to begin. He calls it a sporting event greater than the World Cup, World Series, and World War II combined. <laughs> <laughs> Utterly ridiculous. I do have to say, this was, like, I could have easily argued for Anchorman. I don't, I don't know if Cycli could have. If he's as big a that, that's the thing. I do need. I, I, I be honest with you with the rewatchability. I just don't know why I've always seen it once. I saw it in college with you guys, or not in college, in high school. But like, I just haven't seen it. So that's the only reason. Like, I couldn't argue for it. It's been forever. I don't even remember some of the quotes. Like, obviously, I remember the memes, like Touche and those things. But like, damn, I don't remember so much of it. Yeah, it's hard it's to argue Hulu. rewatchability when you've never actually rewatched that, it. That's the thing. I was like, I, Anchorman no proof stands, of concept. Yeah. Yeah, Anchorman speaks for itself on rewatchability because we've all rewatched it a hundred times. So it's like I can't say anything else for for that other than, you know, everything else bad. But well played, horns. It was quite a competition. It was fun. I liked that. As did I. All right, so dodgeball, a true underdog story, edges out Anchorman, the Legend of Ron Burgundy, score of three to two. Great matchup. Thank you for uh, being. A good judge banner using integrity and uh, not being biased. Look, not- I'm not going to lie. Going into this, this was going to be a uh, this is going to be a four one win for dodgeball. Just in my head. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's tough if you don't like Will Ferrell too. It is tough when you don't like Will Ferrell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I should, and, and you know what? I should have forgot, remembered that going in this and, and like not even mentioned Will Ferrell the entire time. Like, what if I honestly like you would Will have Ferrell gotten was, more points that way? That would have been hilarious if I like completely was a, like acted like Will Ferrell wasn't even in. Like, this it's movie. not really his movie. We're like his name. Christina is his Applegate name. plays a rock. <laughs> I did try doing that with the story you did making steer it that way about yeah. her and not him. If I could <laughs> give half points, you definitely took a half point away there. <laughs> like, it's really Fred Willard's movie. I mean, he's the head of yeah. the station. Yeah, he's the producer. What? Uh, also, Judd Apatow, when uh, he sprays on the, the Sex Panther, he's the one who yells, it smells like a big foot yeah. dick. <laughs> and uh, Catherine Hahn is in it, too. She works in the office with them. Yeah, I, I, that was another thing with the, I did the same thing with the cast as I did with the quotes. I just, it kept going. And I was like, I can't read every fucking name. Yeah. Because it's insane. Yeah, those those both are just like, who is not in one of those movies that's yeah. from that time? I'll wait. Yeah, I mean, they called them the Frat Pack, right? That core group that they yeah. had. That yeah. Just I'm actually it. shocked that Will Ferrell didn't have a cameo in Dodgeball. Yeah, me too. There's a couple guys he could have played for sure. Fucking Chuck Norris. All right. Yeah, I'm that surprised. Also, us. you didn't mention Chuck Norris. That was a. Yeah, I, I thought on cast you were just. Oh, you did. did I, not on cast. Not in cast. Not in cast. That's, but he that's is what I mentioned. That's what I meant. No, no, no. That's what I meant. Like I thought for cast, I was sitting going, "You're just gonna go Chuck Norris, and that's it." <laughs> David Hasselhoff has a cameo. He's the German team's coach. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, one other thing unrelated to all this, but when the uh, dodgeball tournament starts, it like shows the bracket. One of the teams is called the Clown Punchers. <laughs> they don't show them in a game at any point, but I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Ridiculous. All right, that brings us to the second part of our show, which is our protein shake, where we go around and talk about what is in our cup, also known as what have we watched lately. I'll go first real quick. Guys, I watched Dodgeball today. <laughs> Tell us what, what did you think about the cast, the story, nah, I, your big yeah, I don't scene, know, impact. What if, I, what if I went into it? People would be like, holy fuck, what is this? <laughs> I just had to get that off my chest. Uh, Banner, since you haven't got to talk much by way of being a judge, uh, why don't you start off soft? What is in your cup or what have you watched lately? All right, I'm going to start off with a TV series. Um, this is one that it got renewed for a second season. And this is, uh, I believe, a Hulu original, Hit Monkey. Um, or Marvel's Hit Monkey. Uh, animated? It is animated, yes. Huh. Um, very, very adult animated. Lots of gore, lots of blood. Um, this is one that uh, I wasn't sure about about halfway through. I was, I was thinking, how the fuck did this get a second season? Uh, once you get to the end, I get it. Uh, Jason Sudeikis is uh, one of the main characters. He is amazing. It's ba- most of the show is him talking to a monkey that can't talk back to him. Uh, but they 
he's a ghost and they they can communicate you know like telepathically um you get some you get lots of like r2d2 c3po vibes where c3po talks for r2d2 jason stakes his character talks for the monkey sometimes like his thoughts out loud and things um it's uh it's pretty good guys uh this is about an assassin who has some demons and he can't actually complete dying until he um i guess exercises these diamonds so he's just a ghost that follows around this monkey um and the monkey uh spoiler alert becomes an assassin himself oh uh there are some great kills there's one where you got three guys stabbed into a wall through all three of their eyes like just so straight like- through the back of the skull it's like pretty gory and raunchy, like TVMA. Oh yeah, very gory. Yeah, definitely TVMA. This is not for uh, okay. the kids. Lots of lots of sex, drugs, drinking, uh, jokes. Put sex. the kids to bed. Yeah, yeah. This is a this is after everybody goes to bed kind of a kind of a show. I Does believe the like, monkey have sex? I mean, I'm sure all monkeys have sex. <laughs> I, I meant. I think he means story. on the show. Oh uh, no, I, I mean, he like does not. Are you sexually active? He does not, but he does have a little. I love that banner his, answered uh, that like legitimately. Like Scien- well, he's yes. a scientist. Yeah, he's. A... I mean, what? What else do you want me to say? <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure that monkey's still a virgin. That's a lie. Yeah, he's cool as fuck, bro. He's getting yeah. laid all the time. Yeah, he's a he's a monkey that wears sunglasses. He's 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 fucking all the time. Um. Quick episodes, like 20, 25 minute episodes. Uh, pretty good. I'm I'm excited for the next season. This is probably one that I'm gonna forget about, and then all of a sudden it's gonna be like second season. Watch now, and I'll be like, oh what's, yeah, I remember that one. I think you might have said, but what's this streaming on? Uh, Hulu slash uh, Disney Plus. They're like one in the same, but same same but different now. Great reference. I, I hate that. I love that movie because <laughs> I hate that movie. Yeah the interview i hate the uh, idea of that movie i guess uh so yeah hit monkey it's uh it's suggested it's, it's solid i'm interested based on the uh raunchiness of it yep cycle what do you got in your cup uh let's see i okay we you and i share a couple i know that um mm-hmm. how intense did you talk about abigail on here uh i actually think i put it in a squad blog so not at all Okay, do you want to talk about Abigail? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I watched Abigail, um, which um, recently came out horror thriller. But I would honestly, I would call this more of a black comedy, like thriller. Like I don't even know if it's thriller. Like, like a, not I mean, kind of actiony black comedy action dark. Like right. Like what would you call this? Yeah, it's not trying to like scare you, even though there is like a vampire concept in it. Um, yeah, I would say it's like a a dark comedy action movie, maybe with horror elements. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, you saw this; you ca- it was highly recommended by you. I, I I had seen the trailer, which I I thought was really cool. The trailer opens with like you know this little girl ballerina and gets kidnapped and i remember seeing the trailer and i was like oh this this looks really good she's kidnapped and the group of kidnappers you know it seems like they're not sure why they kidnapped this girl and then in the trailer i was a little frustrated that they reveal a little too much right like and and this isn't really spoilers because i mean they show you in the trailer so i apologize i apologize if you're like frustrated that we're saying this but like all of a sudden the little girl's a vampire and the kidnappers don't know that she's a vampire and I really was annoyed at the trailer. I was like, come on, dude. Like I, cause I'm a firm, I, I have, I'm, a, I'm firmly frustrated in trailers showing too much nowadays. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's pose this question and maybe Vayner's the best person to answer yeah. this. If you went into the movie and found out in the film that she was a vampire, would you be like, fuck, that's a cool twist. Or would you be like, oh, come the fuck on. Like, let me know what I'm getting myself into. I don't think painters. Did you just ask me that? I'm sorry, you cut out for a no, second. No, I, I guess your opinion would be better too because you've actually seen it. Like, do you think they were like, oh, dude, we, as much as we'd love to like make this a twist in the movie, people are going to be super fucking pissed if they show up and all of a sudden it's about a vampire. Banner, did you hear that question? I don't think he did. 
Oh, he didn't hear. Um, I, so my answer would be like, as someone who loves like being torn out, twisted at the in the middle of a movie, I would love loved it. I think, but you're right. I mean, I could have seen myself also halfway being like, "What the fuck? I didn't sign up for a vampire movie." Um, so I, I definitely get the like, you know, they're damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing. But what I will say is, at the same time, that I also see why they revealed it because the movie doesn't rely on the twist, right? That's it not plays even twist, into yeah. it. It's not even a twist. Yeah, that's not even it's the movie particularly is like it's like going to see a movie about Dracula and being like, I didn't know Dracula was a vampire. It's like that's not what the movie's about. And and so that's something I will say, like, once you know that it doesn't take away from the film. So, um, yeah, like so I I really once you get past that and that's why when you recommended it, I was like, OK, because the trailer was interesting um, and, and the movie's fun. Right. Like, that's what I took from it. It's a blast. It's it's entertaining. It knows exactly it, what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And and the, the 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 acting, the kid is really fun. The kid is really good. I thought she was really like just kind of like played her part. She's a great kid actress. Um, but what, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts, role. too. Gr- fantastic kills, by the way. Oh, yeah. I, I just um, loved how the, the characters were very, like, caricatures of people to make them super expendable. Yes. Where you're, you're almost like, I hope yes. all these motherfuckers die. Typical heist film, right? Every every member of the troupe is, like, mm-hmm. brings a different element to the, to you know, to the team. Yeah, you could almost, like, uh, to the actors, you could describe their character each in, like, two sentences and be like, you can fill in the blanks because the rest of it doesn't really matter. Like, you're strong muscle head who's an idiot and just does whatever he's told. Your hacker girl with a dark yep. past who ha- is a little bit uh, of a moral compass here. Yeah. Your drug addict guy who uh, is probably going to be the first one to die because you're really stupid. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's just great and it makes them very expendable. And I, you know, I always love movies that like take place almost in real time in like one setting and being confined to this mansion uh, where it's like Hunter becomes the hunted. I just thought it was a really cool element. Now, having said that, like I'm grading this on a curve, right? Like this is not like the movie of the year, but it's super fun. And if you want like a good like genre movie mixed with like thriller, stupid uh kills like you said this was like i was exactly in the mood for it when i watched it and it's just a fun like movie experience i think what's the runtime? i, I think on this? it's just entertainment Good uh question. hour 50 hmm. yeah it's like 10 minutes longer than it needs to be but yeah having it's, it's said an that, hour nine yeah it's a, sorry it's 109 minutes so an hour 50 but the very end of it i, I won't spoil this part but uh cycle i thought the last five minutes was a, a pretty cool like a, 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 i liked it there's a I won't say what happens, obviously, but something big happens. That's a pretty cool way to end yeah. the movie. Okay. It's definitely, I just think it's pure entertainment. Again, like sometimes, like it's like we've said multiple times on this pod, like I don't need a movie to be the best thing I've ever seen. I don't need, I don't need to be moved. I don't need to be emotional. Like sometimes I just need a movie to be entertaining and fun. And that's what this is. Yeah. This movie you actually, you don't have to think what it's much. trying to do very, very well. Again, it's not trying to win an Oscar. It's, it's uh, I don't know. It's, and uh, guys, where does John Carlo Esposito find the time? He's in fucking everything. I know he I is. Know. Yeah, I don't know. It's impressive. It's ridiculous. And he was just seen on set of the new Captain America movie, and I was like, dude, like, does he just sleep in like being filmed? Like, when does he have time to eat? He doesn't. Nice. Just, Which is just... honestly, if you know his story, it's pretty. It's pretty cool. I don't, but I don't. I'd love to hear it sometime. Well, that'll we'll have to save that for another pod. Yeah, I mean, it's just like it's just like I think he's just happy to work. Like I think there's a reason why he's in so much. Yeah, I mean, I love it. He's a great actor. He's compelling and everything. Um, all right, I watched. Uh, this is one that Cycli and I share. I watched a Hulu documentary that came out. Was Cycli was the contestant last year? Was it twenty yeah. twenty? Uh, 2023 been, it was they've been wanting me to get this sell me on it or don't all right banner this is the wife would uh brooke banner would love this too this is kind of it's not true crime but it's it'll it's unsettling let me put it that way so <laughs> yeah. the plot of the contestant it's in it's about a japanese reality show uh that happened cycling when did the show happen? was it 20 it was, it was 1998 okay to like 2000 
Okay, so like sort of the start of the internet, because live streaming is like sort of a new, it's a novel concept in the, the documentary, right? Like they talk about, it sort of became a thing during the show because they were able to live stream him. Yeah. Um, Banner, the, the uh, concept or the conceit of this game show, quote unquote, a reality show, again, sort of the start of reality TV, I think Survivor was what, like 98, the first season? Yeah, 98, um, 99, somewhere around there. So one man in Japan is taken to an apartment and he's told there that he has to basically give up all of his possessions, including his clothes. So he, he strips down naked. He's in the apartment. All that's in the apartment for him is a seemingly endless uh, library of magazines, an unlimited amount of postcards and postage, a radio and a telephone. And he is told, and Cycle, I'm going to need you to fill in one of the blanks here for me, but he is told that to survive, he will only have access to things that he wins through either radio call-in contests or magazine contests that he has to send in entries to. Now, Cycle, yeah, like, my two questions. He was allowed to leave any time, but what was he told the prize was for this? He, I don't know if he was told. I mean, all he said to to win is he had to win a million. He, he had to win a million yen, yen right? worth of prizes, which is like fifty to get it to win. I think they said, yeah, yeah. So like, for, probably it was the, the the room was filled in magazines and postcards that were for yeah, like for for prizes. And so Banner, the guy starts like obviously frantically trying to win these things, and he's. Sort of dividing his, I think in the beginning he's trying to win like things he needs to survive, like food and things like that. But as time goes on, he obviously wants to win higher valued items because that will help him leave quicker. Like he'll win the game sure. faster. Sure. And Cycli, I'll, I'll turn it over to you here. But what happens is you sadly see, even though this guy is allowed to leave anytime he wants, he essentially gets like Stockholm Syndrome and it's like, even though he, he, he doesn't think this show is airing, which I also don't understand why he would stay if he thought that was the case, because he has aspirations of being an actor. But you slowly see him like mentally deteriorate, and it's actually like really sad to watch. So mm. here's the thing I think it was, it was really fucked up is like, one, he wasn't, t this wasn't like he signed up to be on this show and he understood and he was right. consenting to be on this. And he was like, oh, you can leave whenever you want. He literally was just like blindfolded and put in the room. And he, he had no idea who or where he was. He didn't even know if he was in Japan. Yeah, he's like excited. So, he's, he just thinks he gets to go on like a show. He's like, Fuck yeah. yeah. And then they blindfold him and drive him around. They, he does, and, and basically like he, so he is essentially a prisoner and they give him no food and they strip him down naked. So they literally like, like break him down to like nothing. just nothing and and they break down his psyche and that's the point and when people say why doesn't he leave he doesn't know what is on the other side of the door he doesn't know anything and again yeah. he doesn't know that there is a record like he doesn't know that this is being filmed he doesn't know like he knows it's being filmed but he doesn't know it's live he thinks that if anything he, he it will be filmed and when the show is done when he succeeds maybe it will be a It'll show be but he also later. thinks it will be aired, but he also thinks this is pointless. No one's going to watch this. They're never going to broadcast this because it's just him in a room. And so he, he, and it's sad, dude. He literally goes like what night, 17, 20 days, something without food. They literally are giving him crackers. So the producer talk doesn't, is, doesn't allow the staff to talk to him at all. And they sneak Jesus. him crackers. So he won't die. Oh and God. finally he wins some jelly. And the second he wins some jelly, they, they're banned from giving him crackers. And, and dude, he is so skinny. It's so fucked up. It's, it's and this was something I was texting Jeff the whole time. I was like, look, I'm all for human experiment. Like interesting to see what the human psyche can do. Isolationism, do, like uh, what it does to you. Like, that's why I love like reality TV shows like the, like the, um, what's that show at the circle on Netflix and things like oh, that. Yeah. But like you have to, you know, again, consent and understand what you're doing to yourself and have those options. This guy literally has no idea. And it's like, he's a kidnap he's a kidnapped victim. And it, it's really heartbreaking. And yeah, he finally wins like some rice. And now he finally is like, oh, I'm not going to die. Like, that's how fucked up he is when he wins some rice. He's like, oh, now I know I'm not going to die. Literally fighting um, for his life. And meanwhile, little does he know, like all of Japan is watching him. And not only are they watching him, they are incredibly entertained and laughing about his ordeal. Like he's like crying and they're all laughing. Like they think it's hilarious. Do like, they interview him in the doc? Yes. 
Yes, um, and that's actually the nice thing. He's like uh, one of, he's probably the main person interviewed in it. Like okay. a, a, a contemporary. So we're getting his point of view. Uh, and the producer and the guy who came up with this whole thing. Who was, okay, like, really so we're getting up. both sides yeah. of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I won't spoil, like something happens. How, how many how many months into it is he cycling when the thing happens to him? Like 10? When it happened. Oh, like, yeah, 10 or 11 months. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I won't spoil it for you, Banner, in case you and the wife want to watch it. But something that, that's pretty fucking insane happens to him. Uh, I like texted 10. you when this happened. I was so livid. I wanted to. Yeah, scream. he was like, holy shit, dude. I was like, I know, I know. Uh, but it was just really interesting to see, like, that this, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, on the surface, it seems in, innocent enough. But you watch it, and it does kind of make you uneasy. It's like, I know you watch it in two sittings. Was that, like, just because yeah. you... Had something came up, or were you almost like I'm sort of uncomfortable? No, it it wasn't on purpose. Like it, it it did particularly like work out. It's funny because I paused it with unintentionally at the perfect time because I was texting you like, oh, I'm like halfway done. I wasn't thinking anything of it, and then the next day I restarted it, and I was like, like like five minutes into the rewatch, I was like, oh my god, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> so so yeah, I was I was unintentional. I just got busy or started having to do other things. So. I'm yeah, pretty sure so, if I had hit that point, if I had watched five more minutes, I wouldn't have been able to stop. <laughs> yeah, which uh, it has a a happy ending, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's good to know. It's I mean, good to know that he doesn't die. It's like a roller coaster. There's there's ups, there's downs. We cry, we I, laugh. I, also, I will Vader, say this is. Go, for go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say one huge cultural uh, moment from this documentary is we discover how the eggplant emoji came to be used. That's exactly what I was about to say. Substitute for a penis. Really? That's awesome. I, I had always, no idea. No. Yeah. This is literally where the eggplant like penis, like <laughs> I also thought it was just like an eggplant resembles a penis in some way. Like, I guess so maybe it would have been a review, banana had it not been for this. Yeah. Who knows what it would have been. Kumquat carrot. It's, it's because his nickname was, he has a very long face and his nickname growing up was eggplant in Japanese. And so they use an eggplant to cover his dick because he's naked on the, the show. Time. That's yeah. amazing. So he's like dancing around his apartment and there's an eggplant where his dick is on the screen. <laughs> that, that's worth are. me watching it right there. Yeah. Talk about impact. <laughs> like seriously. Yeah. Yeah. The contestant. Now, uh, when you, if you're searching for this, like on a streaming service, which I'm assuming you you would, unless you just like VOD'd it, uh, there is another, like an actual like uh, scripted movie that came out around the same time called The Contestant, which it's not what this is. So this says like, just make sure you find the right one. This Look came for the out naked old. Japanese man. Correct. That's the dead giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't see any eggplants, you've you've got the wrong movie. Yeah, you've gone the wrong place. All right, Banner, back to you. What's in what else in your cup? All right, this is uh, a new Netflix original action movie. Uh, I think I actually nominated it for a Brosker. Uh, Atlas. Uh, it's got J-Lo in it. Mm-hmm. I watched Atlas. Did you watch Atlas? I, I loved, did. I liked it. Did you like it? I did not. Really? It was, <laughs> uh, it was way too long. Yes. Way too fucking long. Um, I thought the robots were cool. I thought that, like, the idea of having these robots and the people um, like link up and, and have a symbiosis is an interesting idea. I don't think we're very far away from something like that being realistic. Um, yeah, it, I mean, at, at the latest. Um, visually, I thought it was cool. This was about 47 minutes too long. <laughs> yeah, 47. I think it's, it's two hours exactly, and it's like, bro, come the fuck on. Banner, let me get so I put this in my letterbox review. I actually really thought the visuals on this were good. Like the you felt yeah. like the claustrophobia of being in that mech suit, but also the sound design was great on it for a Netflix mm-hmm. film. Uh Sterling K. Brown, I don't know why he like did this movie, but he, I appreciate his effort in it. You know what the problem with this movie was though? The real story and like the interesting part of it is actually what happens before the movie. Like how yeah. Simu Lu and the robots take over. That's the movie. Yeah. And they just tell us that. I'm like, that's what I want to fucking see. Yeah. Like, show me that. See, I, like, the, based on what you guys are saying, like, I want to watch it. But you know what? We need like a reverse director's cut. Can I get like a condensed, 
like a fan cut, like a 47 minute less version. Of- that would be great. I'm, I'm sure someone out there would be like, I will happily put one again. That would be amazing. Um, I think the idea of this is is great. I agree. Like the story is how the robots take over. Like that's what we need to to see, or that's what we the story that needed to be told. Uh, with that being said, other than the length, I th- I really liked it. Yeah, Simu Lu. Um, I don't know how he's directed to play an AI, but man, he was fucking awful in this. Uh, yeah, I don't know how you play an AI. So, like, I was kind of giving him the benefit of the doubt. And he really wasn't in it that much. No, the one scene he was supposed to, he had to have with J-Lo, I won't say, like, what the context is at the end. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the dialogue's a bit rigid, but I was like, Jesus Christ, dude. It was fun, but it would have been a lot more fun and palatable, like you said, if it was 90 minutes instead of, like, two hours and two minutes or whatever it was. Yeah. That was, that was my biggest, biggest issue. Nice. Cycling, what you else go. you got? I'll be fast on these. I, I had a kind of a nice retro weekend. It was, I had a good time on Friday. I went and saw uh, 1996 uh, Twister in theaters, uh, which is a guy's nice little prelude to uh, the, I don't know if it's necessary. I think it's a s- sequel. Uh, Twister's coming out in July. Um, it was just fun to sit and take is, some yeah. of our friends uh, here to a movie, you know, being from Oklahoma, um, sharing that with our friends. Like, I mean, it's one, it's an iconic film, but two, being extra special, being from Oklahoma. Um, and uh, just so what did just, they think about it? I don't think I actually asked. Oh, you. they loved it. I mean, it's peak 90s. I don't know how long when the last time you guys saw it. I don't know how we haven't done a commentary on it, but <laughs> Twister is so peak 90s. One fundamentally amazing cast, by the way. Uh, oh, yeah. But, it's it's just so ridiculously over the top, but like it really does transform you like to a different era, like pre nine eleven, different world. Like like it's just so much like we just looked at everything differently, and the concept like you I don't think I think you make this movie it looks completely different in the mid two thousands. Um, you just can't get away with some of this stuff. It's just like absurd, but I absolutely love it. Um. But we had a blast. Like it, it was just uh, so much fun. Everyone in the theater was having a good time with it. Uh, the so movie it's absolutely like holds why. Up. It's like why you go to the movies, films like this. Exactly. Like and and what's fun is the cultural impact that had. Uh, there's there's actually a fundamental massive uh, movement that caused a huge influx of people studying meteorology. Um, there, there's exactly. actually been a lot of data that shows that. But it, but it's funny because it's like the movie is also all overly uh, ridiculous when it comes to the science. But fun film. And then on Saturday, I went and saw Fellowship of the Ring uh, extended edition in theater, which was also awesome. Oh, I thought you were Return of the King for some reason. He cut out. He froze. Yeah. And I did on. Oh, you saw I, both. I, I dropped you for a second. Yeah, I saw. See, it's it, it's yeah, such sorry, a I'm, terrible fucking I'm movie. He just keeps dropping out. Like even even the pod, yeah. <laughs> like the pod gods are like, no, he can't talk about this. It's saying no, but uh, yeah. So I did fellowship on set. So they were the all across the country. They were doing fellowship on Saturday, two towers on Sunday, and return on Monday. So I would have so liked did, to have done all three, two but just home, too much. At least I did watch two towers at home. Yeah. Okay. Good. I just threw up in my. Um, I, I really wanted to. Uh, you're, it's they're the greatest movies of all time. You're insane. Uh, I'll kill you. What did you just say something? Um, no, I did say thing. I, I I really wanted to see Two Towers uh, in theaters just for the scene where Aragon kicks a helmet and breaks his toe because it's a big meme. Or when he kicks the helmet, it's a big joke that everyone yells. Did you guys know that he broke his toes in real life when he kicked the helmet? Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, no, it was, a, it was a fun because everyone, there's big Lord of the Ring meme culture. And again, you go into like a movie like Twister or Lord of the Rings, like everyone there is there having a good time, like making comments, talking, enjoying it, like being part of the experience, right? Like people aren't there, um, seeing it for the first time. Everyone's there showing, seeing a movie they love immensely. It, it was cool because I have the extended editions. I've seen them a bunch, but to see them in theaters like on the big screen like that with the score um was just so much fun to do so um it was just really epic that's awesome two towers is my favorite so 
that would have been I would have been like the I know that which is the one thing I was kind of bummed about because seeing just the Helm's Deep battle which is one of the most iconic oh, battles yeah. in film history in in the screen would have been I, I just couldn't get away with seeing all three extended no, that's in insane theaters. Yeah, in, that's in three days. hours that's yeah 24 hours <laughs> I I would have done it but yeah how long is the third one it, the extended is for four hours and 20 minutes God, but geez. but I think but 20 20 or 30, 20 or 25 minutes of that's credits guys come on it's not that long that's true because there's like so many people that worked on those films. yeah Actually, it, it really is insane, amount, but it, I, I did go to the bathroom twice and like have a conversation with the like with, with people. Like it wasn't like, you know, you sit there the entire time. Yeah, your body would like shut down if you tried to yeah. sit still. And there were no trailers either. Like you, li- it literally started oh, off. Oh, that's dumb. good. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, that's always nice when you go and see those old movies. They don't. I don't know if, if they can put trailers, but they never do. Um, they did yeah. when we went and saw the 25th anniversary of uh, Phantom Menace. There was no trailers. It just boom right into it. That's all. Awesome. Which is good. People need to know that because, like, how many times people are getting to movies late because yeah. the trailers are getting longer yeah. and longer now. Like, that's good to know. Yeah, the trailer thing is that's a whole other topic. All right, anything else, Cycli? Oh, that was just fun retro weekend. You could uh, two good picks there. Um, all right, I'll uh, Banner. Do we want to talk about Under Paris, or do we think we'll do a commentary on it? So we'll just tease it a little bit. What do you think? Uh, I mean, I think we're definitely going to do a commentary on some point. So I think we we can tease it a little bit. Uh, maybe no spoilers here. Uh, I yeah. think everybody should watch it. It's fucking it's fucking awesome. Yeah, Under Paris, which is kind of like the uh, movie everyone's talking about right now. It's on Netflix. It's a French film. It is essentially, I would say, French Jaws, especially in the plot conceit, yep. where a shark is uh, attacking and killing people in the Seine River in France. Does and it have the, a beret and a cigarette? Uh, it, yes, it has like a, one of those like art palette things, and it keeps that asking. Is, it keeps it's asking actually a me, like, it's actually a mime. The shark is. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's I asking the people it's that. painting to to pose nude before it <laughs> kills them. Uh, and the mayor of uh, France will not close Paris. down the mayor of Paris. Paris. Excuse me. Well, not yeah. France is not a mayor. They're president. Will not cl- close down Paris because they have a triathlon that is about to be swam there. Similar to Jaws, how it's like Labor Day weekend. It's a big tourist weekend. We can't shut down the water. Same thing here. Uh, really, really fun movie. I one nice thing about like the current day and age that we live in with media is like, this is a movie that like 10 years ago, I probably never would have known to even click on and watch. And if I did the second that I saw that it was a French film, I probably just would have been like, I don't really feel like reading subtitles and would have not given it a chance. But because I'd seen so many things that say, you got to check this out. It's massively entertaining. I'm glad that I gave it a shot. Uh, Did you you watch it with the English dub over? No, I didn't even know that was an option. Oh yeah, dude. A lot of these, a lot of these now that are coming on Netflix, they have uh, English dub overs. It's awesome. Okay, but I okay. I mean, maybe this one was different, but it drives me crazy though when the word like the lips don't match the words. Ah, get like, over it, yourself. I can't, I can't over do yourself. it. I can't. Yeah. All right. So commentary on that coming soon. Uh, one yeah. other thing I'll just mention that I actually just watched a couple hours ago was the uh, Ishana Night Shyamalan, M. Night Shyamalan's daughter, directed a horror movie called The Watchers with Dakota Fanning. I know Cycli knows about this. Ben, have you seen the trailers or anything for no. this? No, I haven't. So the concept is a uh, woman played by Dakota Fanning. Um, her car breaks down in Ireland. She's tra- she actually works for a uh, like a pet store, and she's transporting this like rare parrot from their store to the zoo. And she has to drive through this wooded area and her car breaks down and she is like walking, trying to find help. And she stumbles upon this uh, like it's like a small it's not a compound, but it's like a fortified like shelter. And there are four people, excuse me, three people in the shelter who take her in and say uh, for her safety, she has to stay there. And at night, there are these creatures that basically like hunt human beings, but she's protected in the shelter and during the day, if she tries to escape, uh, they always end up getting lost or aren't able to find their way out. And 
mystery ensues as to who these creatures are, who these people are that she runs into. Is she being lied to? Is she actually in danger? Um, things kind of go from there. I told Cycli two things about this. No spoilers. Um, Ishana Night Shyamalan, I think, has good directing chops. Like, this thing looks really good, sounds really good. It's acted actually probably better than a lot of M. Night Shyamalan's movies, <laughs> which has always been sort of his real weakness as a director, right, is getting good performances out of actors. Um, and there's some good, like, horror elements and some thrills. The problem is twofold. Number one, it doesn't show you the creatures near enough which is kind of always a problem with these movies. It's like, well, we don't want to overdo it, but also, like, if you don't show it enough to us, I'm not really, like, what am I afraid of here? And the second part is the lore, or, like, what actually, there's a pretty big twist in this movie. What actually ends up being, like, the plot conceit is really, really dense and heavy and a big, It's I guess ambitious is the one way to put it, and it just totally missed me. I was like, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> I was not into whatever they were going for, but it's ambitious, I'll put it that way. Should, do you think I should watch it or should I wait till it's on the library app? I would wait till it's on the library. Uh, but it was nice and short. It was like an hour, 30 minutes. And Dakota Fanning, I always like seeing her and stuff. She's not in much. She's doing all before. right. Doing good. Look, doing, doing good. Healthy. She's healthy. that perpetual like eight year old in my head, though. <laughs> right. She's wore the yeah, world's like, girl. And yeah, you know, I feel like fire. it's weird to see. Like, Yeah, but she's great in it. Um, the rest of the cast, the only other girl that I recognized, let me look up her name, Cycli, but it was the girl from Barbarian. Oh, okay. The main girl. Uh, yeah. Her? She's actually really good. I saw her. So she's like kind of cut. Georgina Campbell, the main girl. Uh, she's really good in this too. She, is, I didn't know she was British. She has a British accent in this movie. Oh, hello, Gobner. Is... Hello, Gobner. <laughs> in it? It's coming home, isn't it? Crumpets, crumpets. So I would not recommend The Watchers, but if you are a... I've seen so many... I'm, I think my goal now, Cycle, you're kind of in this boat with me. We're just going to see, like, almost every horror movie that comes out this year. Yeah. I mean, it, we got a lot. I'm, I'm excited about Long Legs. I mean, that one's getting... I know the trailer threw you off a little bit. That's getting a lot I mean, of talk I'll, about it. I'll probably end up watching it. Although Micah Monroe and Nicolas Cage, if you said they're, they're supposed to scare me, I'd be like, wow. I, I know, but if I'm hearing good things. All right. I'll give it a shot. Uh, all right. That's all I got. You guys got anything else? I'll go oh, one oh, more. Oh, go I'll ahead. go okay. one more. One more. Do it. Uh, Netflix. Uh, again, I think it's a Netflix original. Maybe not. Uh, Hitman. Uh, since oh, 2023. Oh, hell yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, this was uh, this was serviceable. It was fine. I enjoyed it, I guess. I liked it. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I like. I can't really. I can't. There are elements of it that I really liked. I think the the idea and the concept of um, being an undercover hitman is hilarious, or like a fake hitman like that. Um, some of the some of the things that happened in it, I was like, man, okay. Uh, Glenn Powell, uh, he's like the child that Brad Pitt and Sam Rockwell didn't want to have. <laughs> Okay, can I say my issue with I I like Glenn Powell. I know he's obviously in Twisters, which Cycli mentioned. He's like he was in Anyone But You, Top Gun Maverick. He's like the actor du jour right now, and I have no problem with that. I, I dig it. He'll probably be in a Marvel movie soon. Casting him as the nerdy guy with two cats who can't get laid makes it's insulting. It is. I was I was offended. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, we're gonna like put a greasy polo on him and like slick his hair down. And I'm supposed to believe this guy's not banging nines on the reg. Like it was almost like, like laughable. It's like putting paint on her overalls and putting her hair in oh, Briggs. Jamie Briggs? <laughs> oh, and her glasses. Oh, <laughs> paint exactly. on her overalls. And don't worry, darling, where they were like, yeah, Harry Styles is this fucking incel. I was like, what? In what world? <laughs> like, don't even try that. So I was, I was a little thrown off by that. Although I will say Banner, they kind of abandoned that notion of his character pretty early on, which also doesn't really make sense, but I was like, no, whatever. It doesn't. at least this fits more with like what he aesthetically looks like. <laughs> the, like, uh, I, I really like the, uh, the cop that got suspended at the beginning. Um, I thought he, he was, was hilarious. Anytime oh, he was, he's on screen, I was dying laughing. He was fun. I was glad they brought him back. Cause I was worried the way they kind of like write him. Glenn Powell, Powell's character 
into his place. I was like, oh, man, I hope this guy comes back because he's fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was a little slow 30 minutes in, but we got cooking a little bit after that. Once we got everything kind of all, all the pieces in, in place. Yeah. Worth a poke. Good. Worth a poke. Yeah, I would recommend it. All right. That's all I got. Cycle, you got anything else? I was just going to give a quick update on the last few episodes I've been on. I've been doing my Game of Thrones rewatch and I told mm. you guys how I've been feeling about it and my nervous about it. Right. Like how, how I'm going to be feeling. And, and about two weeks ago in our last episode, I was like made it through the Red Wedding, which was painful, just as always got through the White Wedding, which was satisfying to see Joffrey die getting to Tyrion's trial and which is awesome. But I was like, I'm hitting the I'm hitting the breaking point. I don't know. And guys, it's been two weeks. I haven't watched any episodes since. Wow. And I, I don't like feel fear of, of what. No, coming? I just I just I just have zero motivation to keep going. It's not like I'm against it. I'm not actively saying, oh, I'm done. There's just not any part. I'm like, oh, yeah, let me keep watching. I just I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think I, I think I peaked. So that's that's wow. probably where I'm always going to be with Game of Thrones is about four and a half seasons worth it. I'm not saying it. I mean, it's like, you know, if Jeff, if you ever watched it, I'd be like, no, you got to do it. But like as someone who's rewatched it and knows how it ends, it's like, I think that's all I can do. Yeah. I mean, if I haven't seen it, I'm saying I need to watch the whole thing. But for you who like knows what lies ahead, um, yeah. you have. I, I, I still am considering maybe jumping ahead to season six because season six is really good. Great stuff happens, but we'll we'll see if it comes to that. But right now I just I'm good where I'm at. I I'll, saw Joffrey uh, die. I'm really happy about it. I'll I'll update you guys uh, next pod. But we actually started over House of Dragon with the new season coming out. Okay. Um, yeah. Just as a good refresher, a, dude. The names are so fucking hard to remember. I and, know. Like they all look the same. It's it's Aegon, Aragorn, yeah. yeah, Aben, and yeah. so we decided Lideris, to go through a refresher. <laughs> uh, I think we're like four four or five episodes in. Um, and I'm feeling like, okay, once we get through this, I may, I may be able to jump into Game of Thrones. It's, uh, I'm not going to say I got that itch yet, but I can, I can feel a little tickled. I mean, it's still incredible. That's what, that's what hurts the most. That's why it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. House of the Dragon, I feel like has reminded a lot of people about like what good Game of Thrones was. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Fuck. I want to go back and revisit that. I'm glad uh, that it's like reinvigorated the fan base. That's all I got. That's all right. It. That brings us to the <laughs> last part of our show. Which is, here it just teased is, do you even lift bra? Question and answer segment where we ask a question that we leave. I don't know what that was like a giant. Was like a sleep. <laughs> that didn't work. Sorry, guys. I was, question I was trying week. it out. Didn't fit. What are the bros top 100 movies of all time? We have been counting down this list for the better part of a year and probably like a half at this point. It's linked at the beginning of the description of this episode. Before we get into it, uh, Cycli, why don't you tell the people what these lists are? Because as we always say, this is not like your IMDb or AFI's top 100 movies from a film institute. This is a little bit of a more uh, bro unique flavor to them. This is your definition of however you define your favorite movies. These are going to be your literal like favorite movies you put on that you are you consider the most rewatchable movies. These could be the movies that are most impactful for you in terms of how they've dealt and that how they've formed your life. The most movies that made you cry, laugh, um, the most movies that have stayed with you, um, the movies that you put on that uh, didn't bring you comfort. Right. It doesn't matter. It could be it doesn't have to be an Oscar. Winner. It could be the dumbest movie of all time, as is if you look at all of Brian's top 100 movies. It's just it's whatever you want it to be. So, uh, yeah, it's it's your favorite movie. And that word favorite is whatever you want it to be. It's personal to you. Very well said. Uh, as always, we encourage you at home to start putting together your list. And if you don't even know how to start, uh, I think what we all did is I just got out a Google sheet. I thought of a movie that I've seen and you put it. It's basically like Plinko, right? You drop it in the top and you see how far it falls. And when you find a movie that you say, uh, this movie is not better than that. That's where it stops, basically. It's a fun list. All right, uh, let's begin with Brian Banner. We are counting down, and we are currently at each of our number 36 movies of all time. So, Brian, just to catch the people up, and again, this list is linked both at our website, broforsquad.com, or in the description of this episode. But, Brian, your number 37 was a movie that I really want to go back and revisit, and that was Disturbia with Shia LaBeouf. What's one ahead yeah, of that? Is that one Definitely in. And yes, great Rihanna song as well. 
Um, my number 36 movie of all time is Mrs. Doubtfire. This Hello. is... Hello! <laughs> Guys, this is a classic from our childhood. It's it's mm-hmm. just as funny today as it was when we were kids. Uh, it tackles some tough and difficult topics, you know, divorce and custody and stuff like that. Uh, but it does it in a way that kids kind of understand and have fun uh, with it. And, it. and it's not over their heads, but over their heads uh, and still hits hard for adults. Uh, like I said, it's this is just a great movie, whether I watched it when it came out or now. Fantastic movie. Robin Williams at his best. Yeah, Robin Williams uh, showcasing how he can do dramatic and like slapstick comedy all in one. Literally runs a game of emotion. And then also at that time, late 90s, how cool was it to see James Bond in something? Like, yeah. Was, right? That was fun. That's a good cool. pick, Banner. Thank you. All right, Cycli, what is your number 36, one ahead of Inglorious Bastards, which was your 37? Um, so this is a, this was really tough for me to place because a lot of times when I think of like, again, when I was giving the descriptions of like my top 100, a lot of times when I look at these movies, I look at like, I look at it from a cinematic moment, you know, like what are some of these movies that I think are like some of the greatest movies of all time. And then I add in a formula of like, but also at the same time, what is rewatchable to me and then what brings comfort or joy to me right like and like it like builds into this whole thing um the way i look at this but this movie is probably one of the least rewatchable movies of all time and and in all honesty it would be really hard for me to be for like to you would have to pay me to probably watch this and so it was it's interesting to be like where why is this on my list it's because what I said originally when on the description, this is one of those impactful films I've ever seen. And even though I've actually seen it twice, um, I, I still remember every moment of this film extremely vividly. And it's so monumental and powerful that even though it's not entirely rewatchable, it's, it's, it's so meaningful. It deserves a, pl- a place on this list and very much so high. And I fundamentally believe every person in the country should watch this movie. And it's Darren Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream. Um, it's I, I actually fundamentally believe if they showed this movie to every eighth grader in the country. We wouldn't have a drug problem in, in this country. Yeah, uh, it, it's so um, it's a beautiful film. And that's a, when I say beautiful, I'm not saying like it's a happy film. It's absolutely not. It's a film that's literally just so character driven in terms of just like a story being told about broken characters and broken people and a broken family and broken relationships and friendships and people who are desperate to connect a a mother and son who have lost um, who have lost every semblance of a connection of a a, a, a wife and a girlfriend, a a best two best friends. Um, both all fi- trying to find their place in the world that's rejecting them, all using drugs as a crutch, trying to hope it brings them some sort of happiness. And all of this builds into what you hope is you know, going to be a happy story and them finding their place. And there is a, a, there is a sense of hope for a while in the film. And then what ends up happening is like one thing goes wrong with a lot of things that happen with drugs. And the last 20 minutes of the film is maybe the most heartbreaking, most disgusting, most horrifying things you'll ever see in any in any film. And it, and it will sit you with you forever. And I think it's one of these films that you watch and it ends and nobody you're watching it with will say a word for at least 10 minutes. And uh, the film, the last if you've seen it, I don't want to spoil it, but like there's a specific scene in the last few minutes that Jennifer Conley's character goes through um that is something that darren anofsky saw in real life and so this isn't something that was just like he was like this will be fucked up to show this is something that real people go through and and this is such an epidemic in our country and it's just like why that movie is so impactful and why i believe like it deserves a place on this list why like i said it's not a rewatchable movie it's not a fun movie but it's when i think of my favorite movies it's movies that sit with me 
it's movies that make me think and 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 impact me in my thought and this movie absolutely is that and uh and you guys know how much i fucking hate jared leto so like i don't want to call him before though. he had yeah. gotten super yeah pre-9-11 jared leto could be he's fine you know <laughs> so like uh and, and he, he wasn't you know, weird back then he wasn't weird back then he and actually i always preferred him as like i i don't know he 90s and you know we'll have some fight club later on and things like that but like yeah, the Requiem for a Dream is a must see at least once for everybody. Um, and the the and then Jared Leto's mom is maybe one of those heartbreaking story characters in movie history. It's just absolutely gut wrenching. Yeah, if it's a movie that you saw like 24 years ago and like Cycle said, you still feel feel it the impact of it so much. You're like, I actually don't need to rewatch it. Number one, because it, it affected me so viscerally, and then number two, it's like. I don't want to, but that's sort of the film's intention. I think that speaks volumes to. I I, I think I saw it last in 2010, and I I can vividly remember almost every scene. That's that, that's how impactful this film is. Yeah. I gotta say, Darren Aronofsky, I have not liked almost anything he's done. Uh, I've only seen this movie one time, and it had that same effect on me. How many <laughs> lists do you get where? Equal from two separate people, we have Mrs. Doubtfire and Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> I, I almost go, man, very similar movies here. We go, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. similar there plot is, lines. Yeah, <laughs> there is a trailer, a mashup trailer of Mrs. Doubtfire being like a dark horror movie online. It's just hilarious. I love those. That. Yeah. All right. I, uh, I actually I, hate those because then I'm like, well, that's the movie I want to see now. I know. There's one. Uh, I think they do this shining as like a uh, children's comedy. That's <laughs> shining. Running. That's how that trailer ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I'll close this out. My number 37 was the 1991 animated beauty and the beast. Bonjour. 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 And one, Marie. 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 Hey, one yes. more. We're going to get so sued. Be careful. What do you, oh shit. Okay. That's shit. right. My, that's quote so much of it. Uh, one ahead of that. And number 36 is the 2008 romantic comedy one of the best ever made definitely maybe starring ryan reynolds now two reasons i love this movie number one the plot device i'm a huge fan as cycle knows of the sitcom how i met your mother this movie plays a very similar trope so the premise of it if you don't know abigail breslin plays ryan reynolds daughter And the movie begins, he is in the process of finalizing his divorce with her mom. And she is about eight years old in this film. And she says, Dad, I'm actually curious. You never really told me the story of how you met my mom. And we got married. And she's like, I know you're getting divorced, but I would like to hear that story now. So Ryan Reynolds says, all right, I'm going to tell you the story. But I'm going to introduce my three main girlfriends throughout my life. And I'm not going to tell you until the end which one is your mother. So there's sort of a mystery element involved while you're watching the film. You're seeing Ryan Reynolds' three most important relationships in his life, and we don't know which one ends up being the mother of his child. These uh, three relationships are played by Elizabeth Banks, Rachel Wise, and uh, what's her face from Wedding Crashers? Why is she not in the cast list? Isla Fisher. Uh, So you basically go through the movie. He meets these three women. They come in and out of his life, and you're trying to figure out who is Abigail Breslin's mom. And it has Ryan Reynolds' charm but not his over-the-top snarkiness or cynicism. And I think it's also just a really good lens at, like, how you can't really find your person until you are comfortable with yourself and know who you are as a person. Because a lot of the movie is Ryan Reynolds' character's journey. And, like, look, until I figure my shit out, I'm really not going to be able to commit to someone else. And I I think it's really good because it looks at like sometimes just because a relationship doesn't work out in the long run doesn't mean it was a total failure. And it's like a really kind of optimistic look at finding love and all the different forms that that takes. And Abigail Breslin as his daughter is this is the first thing that I'd seen her in. She's obviously done like Zombieland and Little Miss Sunshine and a few other things. Um, But she's absolutely incredible in this. And this was before Ryan Reynolds. I know he's a, has kind of a polarizing shtick. This is not, he's not acting like Deadpool or like his character in waiting in this. He's and playing Wilder. like, <laughs> right. He's playing like a regular, just charming guy. And, uh, he's at a, uh, he's not dialed up to 11. Let me put it that way. He's at like five or six. And I think it works really, really well. That's how this. I like my Ryan Reynolds. 
Yeah. And if you haven't seen it, again, just like the, the quote unquote mystery element of who is Abigail Breslin's mom as you watch the film, I don't think you will guess who it is the first time you see it. Yeah. Definitely me. My favorite movies. Obviously, it's my number 36. Love it. All right, before we let the people go for episode 225, any closing words of wisdom? Banner, we'll start with you. Um, look, guys, it's it's the summer. It's hot out there. Let's stay hydrated. Um, but we all know that there are people like us that are going to drink too much beer, and we're going to need to get in an ambulance and be rushed to the, to the hospital. Okay? Pull the fuck over. Jesus. It's not that hard. Guys, I'm, I am I am so disappointed with with the local uh, drivers not pulling pulling over. Guys, come on. Guys, Banner says this every week, and so I'm going to say something that we all know is not true, but I just for some reason this popped in my head. Do you think there's a chance that not everyone listens to our podcast? No, I, I no. think what happens is people shut off. They turn off the pod at the end of the top 100 segment. Got it. So that's why they miss this. Is, yeah. Okay, maybe like, we should move. Oh, do you live in it? Do you even lift bras over? Oh, we don't need to listen to the last two minutes. That's yeah, what it, happened. I guess we need to happens. maybe we need to lift at the beginning of the show. Mm-hmm. Maybe mm, interesting. Maybe we, if, if it's costing lives, then yeah, that's a tangible reason because it to, can't be any other option, is all I'm saying. Right? What else would be yeah. people aren't listening to the podcast? Even Come just on. saying that out loud sounds ridiculous. <laughs> God, that just that's <laughs> funniest thing we've said all night. Oh, uh, by the way, Chris Ridzi, one of our uh, long time listeners emailed me this last week. I told them I'd give them a shout out. Sorry it took so long to give you that shout out, Chris. Thanks for listening to the show, buddy. Hope That's how also he's a Chris. he's Chris. great you, you at pulling that. over. He is oh, great at pulling yeah. over. Yeah, Chris does not fuck around when he's driving. He hears a but, siren, he gets to the side of the road. Unlike these other dipshits. Model driver there. Be like Chris. Yeah, more Chris's. All right. I love how Banner related that. Related that to people like, hey, it could be one of the bros in the back of that ambulance who drank too much beer. So if you want the pod to keep going, pull over. <laughs> it might look, I had, look, I had to switch my tactics up because whatever I've, I've been doing, it's not working here recently. Yeah. You know, if you want if you don't want your commentaries to be delayed, get to the fucking shoulder of the road. All right, exactly. What do you got as far as advice goes? Yeah, usually I say, you know, get out of the left lane if you're going slow. But actually, this is something that I've recently realized driving that, you know, if you are on a left turn lane and you have a green light, but not not a left turn green light, just a normal green light. So you're yielding. Right. Yeah. And someone is coming up, not going straight. They're about to turn right. You don't have the right of way. The person turning right has the right of way because they theoretically they also have the option to go straight. So they have the right of way, not going left. So you have to wait to go left. You are the last option if you're turning left, people. Also, you're driving across like at least two lanes yes. of traffic. Like what makes so it goes straight, right. right, left. You are the last choice, buddy. That's it. It's wild we have to explain this to people. The amount of people turning left while you're turning right and about to hit you. And you're like, dude. You can't do You know that. what I see, though? A lot of times the person turning right, like, they're just such pussies to be like, yeah, fine, go ahead, go. Yeah, that's the problem. That's yeah. We're enabling. We're enabling. 100%. They're, they're scared. You scared, bro? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll just close with this. I normally say be, make smart choices when you get your hair cut. This week, Brian sent me no less than three Instagram videos of people <laughs> making choices in the salon. I'll send them to you, Cycli. I, I just... You need to find Jesus. As I'll say to some of these people, y'all need to find. It's it's. I'm not gonna lie. It's it's what I've been doing while I'm using the facilities here lately. Is just <laughs> scrolling through Instagram, finding these awesome haircuts and sending them to horns. One, the kid got his hair shaped like a gigantic popcorn bowl, and then they popped popcorn and put it on his fucking head. <laughs> okay, wait, wait. Are you saying that's that's bad? That sounds incredible. What are you? Who wants to eat to? that? I I would. It wasn't buttered popcorn, so it's not like he's oh. going to get all gross. It was, it was smart pop. At least it was calorie conscious. So I will say that. I just, I don't know. Maybe maybe you guys need to just make the mistake, get the fucking haircut, and then in three weeks come to me and be like, you oh, know what, Horns? I, you were right. I got to show you the Landon Donovan. I'm going to send you that right now. Uh, Does he still this. have it? He still has hair left to do anything with? <laughs> oh, oh, you'll see. Uh. 
Do we need to d react to it on pod or is it something? No, 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 don't worry about it. All right. Well, <laughs> for our legal counsel, Ronnie Stike with the mad scientist, Brian Banner, I'm the mayor, Jeff Ornisak. We are the Bro4 Squad podcast. Thank you guys so much for checking out our show. Follow us on Twitter, threads, Instagram, at Bro4 Squad. We're also on Letterboxd, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube. If you type in Bro Force Squad as three separate words, everything we've ever posted is on our website, broforsquad.com. If you click on the archive.link.org, it has every audio thing we've ever done in the history of time in our squad blog. Until next time, we'll see you at the barbershop where I will be basically bouncing at the door, making sure you don't do anything fucking dumb. Like not pulling over. Exactly. <laughs>